back to how those first disciples who were meeting in Jerusalem, perhaps a year or so after Jesus' death and resurrection, might have structured their worship. The lesson that Bessie just read from Paul's letter to the Colossians describes some of the attitudes of worship that we are called to have. But I wanted this morning to take a few moments and take us back a little further using again one of the resurrection appearances of Jesus that I believe gives us a picture of worship happening in a way and in a place maybe that we don't always think of as worship. It's along a roadside. So from Luke, we read this account, and I'm just going to be reading parts of it and, and then making some comments. This account takes place later in the day, on the day of resurrection, on that first Easter day. On that same day, two disciples were traveling to a village called Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem. They were talking to each other about everything that had happened. While they were discussing these things, Jesus himself arrived and joined them on their journey. They were prevented from recognizing him. And Jesus said to them, what are you talking about as you walk along? They stopped, their faces downcast. I read those first verses and I realize that you know what? We bring ourselves into worship as we are. On any given Sunday, we may enter this sanctuary rejoicing or we may enter with the worries of the world on our shoulders. We may be in an in-between time, wondering what is going to happen next in our lives or in our families or in our jobs or whatever it might be. We may be wondering what is next for us. Right now, I think many of us are wondering what is next for our church. We may be filled with faith or we may be doubting. We may have gotten good news the past week or we may have gotten bad news. These particular disciples, we are told, are downcast. They are sad. And I would say they are doubting. They have heard the reports of Easter morning, and yet they are walking away from Jerusalem. They are walking back home. And I think that what we see here is that God can meet us right where we are at. God doesn't wait for us to get our act together to be filled with a proper amount of faith. God doesn't wait for us to be in the right frame of mind or joyful. God is here with us whether or not we are ready. And God is more than capable of entering into our doubts, our wonderings, our in-between times. Even when we may feel like we are free-falling, God is with us in the fall. I had a professor of evangelism who used to say that his that the call to worship was his most favorite part of the service. And he was, he was a wonderful speaker, a wonderful preacher, and he would often be called by churches to come out for special events, especially evangelism events, or you know, invite a friend Sunday to speak at, at churches. And he would always say, only if I can give the call to worship. Because it wasn't just his favorite part of the service, he thought it was one of the most important parts of the service. Isn't that something I think a lot of us think that's just sort of, you know, something that gathers us together. He thought it was one of the most important parts of the service. And when he got to any church, he would tell the people who had gathered for worship that day, he would say, I don't know why you're here today. You may have come for a variety of reasons. Maybe um, you just woke up this morning and wanted to come to church. Maybe you're here because your wife nagged you into being here. Or your husband nagged you into being here. Maybe you're here because you have been coming to church for as long as you have been alive and you don't know what else you would do on Sunday morning if you didn't come to church. But none of those things are the real reason why you are here this morning. He would say, you are here because God has called you here. God has made an appointment with you. God wants to bless you. And please, don't leave here without receiving the blessing. That really kind of sets the table for expectation, doesn't it, for worship? It doesn't matter why we come. It doesn't matter what brought us here. What matters is that God meets us here. 
And when God is here with us, we can expect a blessing. So without their realizing it, <coughs> Jesus has just joined these two disciples on their journey, and worship has begun. Our story continues. The disciple named Cleopas replied to Jesus, Are you the only visitor to Jerusalem who is unaware of the things that have taken place there over the last few days? And he said to them, What things? They said to him, The things about Jesus of Nazareth. Because of his powerful deeds and words, he was recognized by God and all the people as a prophet. But our chief priests and our leaders handed him over to be sentenced to death. And they crucified him. We had hoped he was the one who would redeem Israel. All these things happened three days ago. But there's more. Some women from our group have left us stunned. They went to the tomb early this morning and didn't find his body. They came to us saying that they had even seen a vision of angels who told them he is alive. Some of those who were with us went to the tomb and found things just as the women said. They didn't see Jesus. Then Jesus said to them, You foolish people, your dull minds keep you from believing all that the prophets talked about. Wasn't it necessary for the Christ to suffer these things and then enter his glory? Then he interpreted for them the things written about himself in all the scriptures, starting with Moses and going through all the prophets. What happens? when we come into the presence of God in corporate worship. One thing, and to me this is a lot of times where the blessing begins, one thing is we realize it isn't all about us. We had hoped. That's what the disciples said, we had hoped. They had their dreams and their plans and their goals even, I think, concerning Jesus. And all of that got left by the wayside when Jesus was arrested and crucified. They thought Jesus was the one who would liberate them, who would free them from oppression. I'm sure that they had plans for where their place would be in the new kingdom that Jesus would usher into place. And all those plans <clears throat> turned to dust. Now I can only imagine how confused they must have been, how consumed with disappointment they were or frustration. Even, I would guess, self-pity. Have you ever had your life all planned out in front of you only to have those plans go completely awry? It's a very disconcerting thing to have happen. If you are a control freak, freak it is really disconcerting. So some of you may have heard this story before, and, and if so, I'm sorry to bore you with it again, but I think some of you may have not. Um, when Lee was in his final year of seminary, we sort of had, I sort of had our life planned out for us. He was going to finish, he was going to be a chaplain at a prison, and I was going to be a social worker, and I was going to uh, go back to school and get my master's degree in social work, and I was going to write a book about a particular subject that I had. And I was really looking forward to that future. And one of the things that actually most excited me about that future was the fact that Lee was not going to be a pastor in a church. He was going to be a chaplain in a jail, which meant that we could sort of attend church anonymously. I grew up in the church, and I knew what life could be like for pastor's wives. And I didn't want to be a pastor's wife. And it, it didn't help that as soon as somebody heard that Lee was going to seminary, they said, you should start taking piano lessons. That did not help. So I had my life planned out, and I was really looking forward to this life. And then one day, one day we were just sitting there in an innocent conversation with some friends who had graduated from seminary the year before and had gone back to Wisconsin to, to, church, to, um, to pastor a church. And as they were talking, and I'm listening to their experiences that they're having in this first year of ministry, God said to me, why won't you do this for me? And that was not a joyous day for me. It, you would think that it would be, 
I mean, looking back now, I think it should have been, but it wasn't because that wasn't the plan that I had. That was not the plan. You know what I did? For two weeks, I cried. And I didn't tell anybody what had happened. And then I told Lee. And he said, go back and pray again. Because <laughs> you might have misunderstood. Maybe God is calling you to be a doctor or an accountant or something like that. <laughs> but, you know, I just think God has an incredible sense of humor. I didn't want to be a pastor's wife. <laughs> so God made me a pastor. <laughs> It was about um, a month after that, and I was praying, and I was driving somewhere. That's when I usually do my best praying. It seems like it's when I'm driving. Um, but I was driving somewhere, and I was really, you know, I had dared to tell a few people, um, but I really was not sure about this. And I remember praying, God, what if nobody believes that I can do this? And God said, I am enough. I am enough. I have called you and I am enough. And that has sustained me through 17 years of ministry to know that God has told me that God is enough. So Jesus takes these disciples and he leads them through the Old Testament, the story of their people, through the prophets, and shows them that this, the crucifixion, the worst thing that could ever possibly happen, was actually part of the plan. And that God's plan was indeed so much greater than their plan. I have often been told by people that they prefer to worship God alone. And usually they add, out in nature, and then oftentimes it is either on a golf course or in a fishing boat. <laughs> that that is where they prefer to worship God. And you know what? I agree with them wholeheartedly that sometimes being out in nature is the most awe-inspiring thing we can do. And, to, and, and it is possible, I know, to be stunned, to be awed um, by God in a fishing boat or on a golf course on a beautiful day. I know that. We can be overcome with the spirit of worship. But this is the part that I believe seldom happens in solitary worship. Or when we are worshiping by doing one of our favorite activities. It is hard for me to remember that I'm not the center of my story. And I think that when we are engaged in solitary worship, it's even harder to remember that we are not the center of our story. That God is the center of our story. When we come together in worship, we are reminded again and again that we are part of a much bigger, much greater story. And while God is with us in our story, God is always drawing us into that bigger, greater story. And that really is a much more exciting place to be. So our story continues. When they came to Emmaus, Jesus acted as if he was going on ahead. But they urged him, saying, stay with us. It's nearly evening and the day is almost over. So he went in to stay with them. After he took his seat at the table with them, he took out bread blessed and broke it, and gave it to them. Their eyes were opened, and they recognized him, but he disappeared from their sight. So I wanted to share with you a story that I heard just this week from one of our district superintendents, Dan Johnson. He uh, serves in the Twin Cities area. But this story spoke to my heart so much because I spent the first part of my adult life, my social work life, working with people, especially young adults, who have developmental disabilities. And I think that this story um, may touch your heart, whether or not you've had that experience, because it speaks to how we see God's table. So Dan's first appointment was in the North Star District, out in a rural area. He had three little churches um, located in towns close together. And in one of those churches, the parsonage was right next door to the church. And about a block and a half away from the church was a group home for people with developmental disabilities. And there was one young man named Doug in that group home that walked and rode his bike often by the parsonage. Well, Dan's young son, Matt, 
made friends with this, this young man, Doug. And developmentally, they were actually pretty close. And so they enjoyed hanging out together. They rode bikes around the church and the blocks, and, and they played together. And one day, Doug said to Matt, what is that big building next to your house? And Matt said, that's our church. You should come. And Doug came to Matt's church the next Sunday. And he started coming every Sunday. Well, like most churches, on the first Sunday of the month, they celebrate Holy Communion. And so they had communion that Sunday, and Doug came up, and he received Holy Communion. And Dan didn't really think a whole lot about that. But after church, as Dan is standing in the back of the church shaking people's hands, Doug comes running down the aisle yelling, Pastor Dan! Pastor Dan! And Dan says, what is it, Doug? And he said, I got the bread, and I got the juice, and I got Jesus. And he was right. He did. Doug kept coming to that church, and he kept coming forward for Holy Communion. And before long, Doug was helping to serve Holy Communion in that church. But some months later, Doug's mom came to see Dan. And she said, I want to thank you for welcoming Doug to the communion table. And Dan thought that was a little bit odd. I mean, we welcome all people. And she said, in the church that we attended before, Doug took the class to be able to take Holy Communion, but he was never, he took it several times, and he was never able to pass the class to get his communion card. So he had never had Holy Communion until he came to your church. Now what Doug said, I, was, I got the bread, and I got the juice, and I got Jesus, that's not a sophisticated theological explanation of Holy Communion, but is that not spiritually profound? I got the bread, I got the juice, I got Jesus. That happened at the beginning of Dan's ministry, so I'm guessing he was around 26, 27, somewhere in there, uh, maybe 30. He's, Dan is close to the age of retirement now. And what I heard was that the pastor who is now serving those three churches said that Doug's um, moved from one group home to another. So he lives in one of the other towns served in that three-church area. And when she first got to that church, the people explained, there are four of us that bring the communion elements. Uh, we take turns bringing the elements in, but none of us serve. That's Doug's job. Thirty-some years later, Doug is still serving Holy Communion in church. Because at the age of 25, he was finally welcomed at the table. Jesus spent his ministry breaking down barriers, reaching out to the ignored and the left out. And as the body of Christ, we can do no less. One of the things that I am most, that most excites me about being a Methodist is that our community table is open to anyone, regardless of their understanding, regardless of their age, regardless of their denominational affiliation. It doesn't matter. If you want to receive Jesus, you are welcome to come to our table and receive Jesus. There is so much beauty in that story that Dan shared. As we take the bread and as we take the cup, we realize, just like those early disciples did that evening in Emmaus, that Jesus is with us. So there's one final part to this story. They said to each other, weren't our hearts on fire when he spoke to us along the road and when he explained the scriptures to us? They got up right then and returned to Jerusalem. They found the eleven and their companions gathered together. They were saying to each other, the Lord really has risen. He appeared to Simon. And then the two disciples described what had happened along the road and how Jesus was made known to them as he broke the bread. Weren't our hearts on fire? That's what's supposed to happen when we come into God's presence. These disciples who had just traveled seven miles, and now it is evening, couldn't wait 
until morning to go and tell the others what they had just experienced, what they learned and what they now knew to be true. May 24th is coming up this week, a few days from now. And May 24th, a lot of you may not know this because you haven't spent your lives as Methodists, and that's okay, but May 24th has special significance for Methodists. John Wesley, the founder of Methodism, understood early on that he was called to serve God and the church. He grew up in a parsonage. His dad was a pastor. He had several methods or disciplines, um, fasting and prayer and Bible study and service uh, in his quest to attain holiness in his life. He went on a mission trip to America, which uh, really went very badly for him. And all through these years of striving and struggling, John Wesley questioned his own salvation. He wondered whether his heart was truly right with God's heart. And he, he did more and more trying to prove himself to God. And then on May 24th, 1738, yeah, 1738, he reluctantly attended a group meeting uh, in Aldersgate uh, in London. And as he was uh, actually, I think it was as he was actually passing by underneath the window in the street, he heard Luther's preface to the epistle uh, uh, to uh, Romans. And he heard about being saved by faith in Jesus Christ, that that was all it took. And he said that as he heard that, he felt his heart strangely warmed. And at that moment, he experienced the truth that God loved him, even him. It was no longer something in his head, he said, but something in his heart. Something changed in John Wesley's ministry after that point. He came alive. His ministry came alive. The difference between a lukewarm spirituality and a heart that has been strangely warmed or a heart that is on fire you can tell the difference because you have a desire to tell somebody the good news. The understanding that you have just received the most valuable gift and you want to share it. It is knowing that Christ is indeed alive and he loves me. Even me. He loves you. Even you. And it is knowing that there is no greater response to such a gift than to give this one wild, precious life that we have back to God to use as he wishes, to say yes again and again and again. Whenever we hear Jesus calling us, whenever we hear Jesus sending us, nudging us, speaking to us directly or through the church, the right response is to say yes. This is the heart of worship. This is what can make worship truly an uprising. Let us pray. What a privilege, what a blessing, God, to gather together in your name, knowing that you are right here with us in our midst. As we give this time to you Sunday after Sunday, we pray that you would warm our hearts, that you would put a little fire in our bellies, that you would give us courage, that you would inspire us, challenge us, comfort us, nudge us, that we might be strengthened and inspired to say yes to you again and again and again. As Jesus taught us, so we pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. 